I've already asked Mita, and she's agreed, that's why she's up here, to read the story for us of Leah's pony, and you'll see it up on the screen. I've made pictures so that you can see the pictures as we go along. And then I will talk to you about how that relates to the message this morning. So could we have the lights turned off at this point, and then we will listen to the story. <clears throat> Am I on? Yes. Okay. This is Leah's Pony by Elizabeth Friedrich. The year the corn grew tall and straight, Leah's papa bought her a pony. The pony was strong and swift and sturdy, with just a snip of white at the end of his long black nose. Papa taught Leah to place her new saddle right in the middle of his back and tighten the girth around his belly just so. The whole, that whole summer, Leah and her pony crossed through cloud-capped cornfields and chased cattle through the pasture. Leah scratched that special spot under her pony's mane and brushed him till his coat glistened like satin. Each day, Leah loved to ride her pony into town just to hear Mr. B shout from the door of his grocery store, that's the finest pony in the whole county. The year the corn grew no taller than a man's thumb, Leah's house became very quiet. Sometimes on those hot, dry nights, Leah heard Papa and Mama's hushed voices whispering in the kitchen. She couldn't understand the words, but knew their sad sound. Some days the wind blew so hard it turned the sky black with dust. It was hard for Leah to keep her pony's coat shining. It was hard for Mama to keep the house clean. It was hard for Papa to carry buckets of water for the sow and her piglets. Soon Papa sold the pigs and even some of the cattle. These are hard times, he told Leah with a puzzled look. That's what these days are, all right, hard times. Mama used flour sacks to make underwear for Leah. Mama threw dishwater on her drooping petunias to keep them growing, and no matter what else happened, Mama always woke Leah on Saturday with a smell of fresh, hot, coffee cake baking. One hot, dry, dusty day, grasshoppers turned the whole day to night. They ate the trees bare and left only twigs behind. The next day, the neighbors filled their truck with all they owned and stopped to say goodbye. We're off to Oregon, they said. It must be better there. Papa, Mama, and Leah waved as their neighbors wobbled down the road in an old truck overflowing with chairs and bed springs and wire. The hot, dry, dusty days kept coming. One day you could almost taste the earth in the air. Papa said, I have something to tell you, Leah, and I want you to be brave. I borrowed money from the bank. I bought seeds, but the seeds dried up and blew away. Nothing grew. I don't have any corn to sell. Now I can't pay back the bank. Papa paused. They're gonna have an auction, Leah. They're gonna sell the cattle and the chickens and the pickup truck. Leah stared at Papa. His voice grew husky and soft. Worst of all, they're gonna sell my tractor. I'll never be able to plant corn when she's gone. Without my tractor, we might even have to leave the farm. I told you, Leah, these are hard times. Leah knew what an auction meant. She knew eager faces with strange voices would come to their farm. They would stand outside and offer money for Papa's best bull and Mama's prize rooster and Leah's favorite calf. All week, Leah worried and waited and wondered what to do. One morning, she watched as a man in a big hat hammered a sign into the ground in front of her house. Leah wanted to run away. She raced her pony past empty fields lined with dry gullies. She galloped past a house with rags stuffed in broken window panes. She sped right past Mr. B, sweeping the steps outside his store. At last, Leah knew what she had to do. She turned her pony around and rode back into town. She stopped in front of Mr. B's store. You can buy my pony, she said. Mr. B stopped sweeping and stared at her. Why would you want to sell him, he asked. That's the finest pony in the county. Leah swallowed hard. I, I've grown a lot this summer, she said. I'm getting too big for him. Sunburned soil crunched under Leah's feet as she walked home alone. 
the auction had begun. Neighbors, friends, strangers, everyone clustered around the man in the big hat. How much for this wagon, boomed the man. Five dollars, ten dollars, sold for fifteen dollars to man in the green shirt. Papa's best bull, sold. Mama's prize rooster, sold. Leah's favorite calf, sold. Leah clutched her money in her hand. It has to be enough, she whispered to herself. It just has to be. Here's one of the best items in this entire auction, yelled the man in the big hat. Who'll start the bidding at $500 for this practically new all-purpose farm all tractor? It'll plow, plant, fertilize, and even cultivate for you. It was time. Leah's voice shook. One dollar. The big man in the big hat laughed. That's a low starting bid if I ever heard one, he said. Now let's hear some serious bids. No one moved. No one said a word. No one even seemed to breathe. Ladies and gentlemen, this tractor is a beauty. I have a bid of only one dollars for it. One dollar for this practically new farm all tractor? Do I hear any other bids? Again, no one moved. No one said a word. No one even seemed to breathe. This is ridiculous, the man's voice boomed out from under his hat in this, into the silence. Sold to the young lady for one dollar. The crowd cheered. Papa's mouth hung open. Mama cried. Leah proudly walked up and handed one dollar to the auctioneer in the big hat. That young lady bought one fine tractor for one very low price, the man continued. Now how much am I bid for this flock of healthy young chickens? I'll give you 10 cents, offered a farmer who lived down the road. 10 cents? 10 cents is, a mighty, is mighty cheap for a whole flock of chickens, the man said. His face looked angry. Again, no one moved, no one said a word, no one even seemed to breathe. Sold for 10 cents. The farmer picked up the cage filled with chickens and walked over to Mama. These chickens are yours, he said. The man pushed, up his, pushed his big hat back on his head. How much for this good Ford pickup truck, he asked. 25 cents, yelled a neighbor from town. Again, no one moved, no one said a word, no one even seemed to breathe. Sold for 25 cents, the man in the big hat shook his head. This isn't supposed to be a penny auction, he shouted. The neighbor paid his 25 cents and took the keys to the pickup truck. I think these will start your truck, he whispered as he dropped the keys into Papa's shirt pocket. Leah watched as friends and neighbors bid a penny for a chicken or a nickel for a cow or a quarter for a plow. One by one, they gave everything back to Mama and Papa. The crowds left, the sign disappeared, chickens scratched in their coop and cattle called for their corn. The farm was quiet, too quiet. No familiar whinny greeted Leah when she entered the barn. Leah swallowed hard and straightened her back. That night in Leah's hushed house, no sad voices whispered in the kitchen. Only Leah lay awake listening to the clock chime nine and even ten times. Leah's heart seemed to copy its slow, sad beat. The next morning, Leah forced open the heavy barn doors to start her chores. A loud whinny greeted her. Leah ran and hugged the familiar furry neck and kissed the white snip of a nose. You're back, she cried. How did you get here? Then Leah saw the note with her name written in big letters. Dear Leah, this is the finest pony in the county, but he's a bit small for me and a bit big for my grandson. He fits you much better. Your friend, Mr. B. P.S. I heard how you saved your family's farm. These hard times won't last forever, and they didn't. Why did I show this story? Here we have a situation in a family's life where things were really getting tough. There was going to be an auction and there were going to be people coming and people bidding for things in order to pay the bank back for the loan that had been taken out. People came from all over. People that really weren't really connected with each other. They were neighbors, and as it is with farms, neighbors sometimes are far away and hardly ever see each other. And so here they came, looking for some sort of special deal. They could get things fairly cheaply if they go to an auction, things that they would have to pay a lot of money under any other circumstance. 
So people came thinking in terms of what it was that they might be able to get for themselves. But somehow or another, the whole story changed. Because somebody in the family began to realize that they were actually a contributing member of the family. This was something that little Leah didn't realize she could do. But it came to her that she could. And therefore, she decided that she would make a sacrifice. She could have blamed her dad could have said, how come, Dad? Why is it that we are losing our farm? Why is it that we're losing all the things that are in it? Why is it that you took this loan out and can't pay it back? Why is it that I have to lose the things that I want? But she didn't. She saw herself as part of this family and said to herself, there must be something I can do. And so she remembered she had a pony. Now you know that that was a huge sacrifice for her to sell this pony, which she loved with all of her heart. Loved riding, had so many experiences with this horse, and now she was willing to give it up in order that her family might be able to survive. She had no idea what, exa what, what was going to happen as a result of her bid, but she still hoped that somehow or other she could save at least the tractor. Remember, her dad had said, of all the other things on the farm, that was the most painful thing for him to think about losing. And that really clicked with her. And she thought, maybe if I sold my horse, I could get enough money to buy back that tractor. Well, you know that as she did that, and as they were going through and having this auction, it started out the way normally auctions do, with bids that are somewhat equal to the cost, or at least lower than the cost of what it ordinarily would be. And people were paying out good amounts of money for things that were being auctioned. But all of a sudden, everything changed radically when she said, one dollar for the tractor. One dollar. That was so astonishing to everyone. It was laughable to the man who was the auctioneer. He said, this is ridiculous. This is, this is too low. We need to start higher. This is a valuable tractor. Who will buy it for more? And nobody would do it. Somehow or another, they got what she was able to do. And they thought about, maybe we could do the same thing. As they were gathered there as a group of people, their whole constitution changed. It was once a group of people looking for a deal. And then it became a group of people looking to save a brother farmer and to make it possible for him to be there for another year at least. This is such an important lesson for people to learn. Some people don't understand that they are part of the groups that they're actually part of. Sometimes you can be even in a family, a nuclear family of only three or four people, and not realize that you're really part of that family. Sometimes young kids don't get it either because they're too young to get it. Teenagers sometimes don't get it because they're distracted with other things. But sometimes things happen that bring it all into focus when there's a need and when there is something that has to be done and somebody's got to step up and do something. And then the group begins to realize that we are somebody. We are a group. And we do have responsibility towards one another. And that we can contribute if the opportunity is presented. And so that is what they did. They bid for little, little pieces, little bits of money. And the, the farm was saved. And so... A wonderful thing happened. This group of people actually became much more like a family. It was Leah, the youngest uh, in the group, who actually inspired this, taught them something that they hadn't learned before, but now they knew what it was. This applies, I think, very closely to the church. As we think about in learning how to pray, you know that we've been praying the Our Father, or the Lord's Prayer, what I've been calling the Great Prayer. And it begins with these words, Our Father. And how important it is that we understand that we are part of that Our. O-U-R, not H-O-U-R. You are part of that Our, that group of people that have something definitely in common.
that realization then changes how we look at things, how we care about things. It's very easy for us in the society in which we live to think in terms of, you know, we're entitled. And the church is really a social agency. And we come here because we are looking for what this church can provide. We look for teaching, we look for love, we look for financial assistance, we look for fellowship with one another, we look for understanding in terms of, of who God is, we look for opportunities to, to pray and things like that. And sometimes if those, those ministries or those offerings that the church has to give are not up to what some other church may be doing down the street, or what some large church may be able to do because of the size of that church, well, somehow or another, then we get the idea that, you know what, we should probably find another church that provides what we need. <clears throat> I think the story talks to us about what do we do when we have a need? If this is our church, if this is our family, and if God has placed us into this group of people and there becomes a need known in which all of us uh, have an opportunity to do something about, why then it really becomes part of our responsibility to do whatever it is that we can. If we don't have that kind of ministry, maybe we could start that kind of ministry that we see is lacking. If some program isn't as good as it could be, maybe we could help it to become as good as it could be. Oftentimes when we are involved in this way to help others, something great happens. We are helped in turn. In the story, Leah gave away her pony in order to save her family. At the end of the story, she was given her pony back. It illustrates, I think, a really important truth. And Jesus says that, you know, as we give, so it will be given back to us. You can't outgive God. And with, you'll find it, and I found it, you, many of you have already found out, that once you become involved and you work and you give of your time and your money and your efforts and your ideas and whatever else you may have, why then you find out that actually you're the one who profited the most, though others have profited from the work that you did. And you receive back manyfold the things that you had given because you cared to do something about what was needed. Our Father. It is our Father. It is our family. He is our Father. And He has indeed given us spiritual gifts as we have noted when we studied the, the Holy Spirit given us spiritual gifts that will enable us to perform what is needed for this family. It may not look like the big church on the hill. But our God is able to minister to our hearts with what we have as a people here. We don't need to have the fancy programs. What we need to have is a servant's heart that says, I will give whatever is needed, whatever I can, because this is our family, and I'm responsible for what happens here. <clears throat> when we talk about our Father, we also talk about the fact that He is our Father. Father. It's important that we know that he is our father, that we have a relationship with him. When we get to the place of prayer, this is so fundamental to how we respond to God. Do we feel welcome? Do you feel welcome when you come to God in prayer? Do you really think that he wants you there? Do you really think that he's pleased with your presence? How is it that you came to him in the first place? Was it that you said to him, God, you know what? I'm really in a good place these days and I'm really kind of excited about the church and I like the people that are here, you know, and I'm going to offer myself to you for your service. That's why I'm here. Is that how it came? If you truly came to Christ on the terms in which the gospel speaks about, you didn't come that way. 
You came with a sincere admission of the fact that you what I am not worthy. I am not worthy. In Luke chapter 18, there are a number of stories in that chapter that talk about how people are unworthy of the things that they receive from God. Take your Bibles, if you would. Turn to Luke 18 for a moment. <clears throat> How hard it is for us to get into the presence of God and be saved. How is it that we could ever be worthy in order to be acceptable to God? There is this parable here in the very beginning of a persistent widow who comes to a, to a judge and asks that he will rule in her favor. And he's, uh, he doesn't care really anything about her. And he isn't really about to do anything for her. But somehow or another, she is so persistent and he, she keeps coming back and coming back and coming back until finally he says, you know what, this lady's driving me nuts. I'm just going to give her what she wants because I don't want to see her again. And Jesus says, your father is not like that. When you come to him, you come to him and he is willing it says, will he not also do those things which you call out for? And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out, in verse 7, to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? No, he's not like that. I tell you, he will see that they get justice and get it quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith in the earth? Will people actually be praying? And one of the things that I really want us to think about this morning is, are you praying? Are you talking to God? Do you feel like he wants you to come into his presence? This parable teaches us that he's much more willing to give the things that we need than we are to come and to ask for them. The second story is about a, tax, uh, about a Pharisee and a tax collector. And they're both in the, in the, in the temple and they're, they're worshiping. The, the, the Pharisee is all about himself, as you understand. You've heard this story so many times. And he's saying to God, you know, I'm, I thank you I'm not like these other people. And he lists off all the things that he does. And then there's this tax collector who's way in the back. He's not bold enough to be up in the front like the Pharisee. And he is saying, God, I am just so unworthy. I am a miserable sinner. And Jesus says that that man who sit in the back is the one who leaves justified. The one who justifies himself will not be justified. It is not those of us who think that we're really welcome because we are so good, but we are welcome because of grace. We can come and pray because God loves sinners, and he loves sinners who admit that they are. So if you're thinking that, you know what, I, I, I don't come to God because I don't know what the words are to say. I don't come to God because I don't think that he, he's pleased with me. Well, then you need to come to him and say, God, I understand why you're not pleased with me. You know, I am a sinner and I am unworthy of being in your presence, but I understand that you're a God of grace and you desire me to come into your presence. The next story is little children. Little, little children are being brought to Jesus. Others are trying to keep them away. That is the, that is the, the disciples. Because, you know, while kids are, you know, are nice and they're cute and they're fun to be with, they certainly should not be using up the master's time. They're not worthy of that. And Jesus scolds them and says, you, you let those children come because, you see, they're important to me. And that we all need to come to him in that fashion with, with faith, trust, and humility because we desire to have him notice us because he desires that we would be blessed by him? Let him come. And if we come to him like little children, and don't come to him with some trumped up idea of our worthiness, just coming as little kids, he wants to bless us. You're important to him. Well, then there's the rich ruler. The rich ruler comes to Jesus and said, what must I do to be saved? Now, everybody would agree that this rich ruler will get what he's looking for because he's rich. Not because he's going to pay for it, 
But a person who is rich is a person who's blessed by God and therefore must be a righteous person, must be a good man. And so when he comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to be saved? Jesus explains to him what he ought to be doing. And the man says, well, I do that. I have done that since I was a kid. I've kept the, the law. I've done what is the right thing to do. And then Jesus says, there's one thing, however. You have an idol in your life. You need to get rid of that. You need to give away everything you have to the poor. And then come and follow me. And then the man realized that there was something that he worshipped more than God. And it was stunning. It was astonishing, especially to the disciples. If he can't be saved, well, then who can? Well, the answer is no one. But God can do everything. He is the one who does it. So when we think about coming to him in prayer, we need to realize that it isn't that we have something to offer to him, but we come to him because he is the one who makes it possible. He is the one who can help us to pray. He desires that we come. He wants us to come like little kids. He wants us to come admitting who we really are. So there really isn't any reason why I shouldn't feel comfortable in his presence because he said that he would make it possible for me to be saved, to become his child. He would adopt me as his child on the basis of what Jesus had done on the cross. And I could come to him on that basis. A rich ruler, blind beggar is the next story. He calls out to Jesus and he's being pushed away royally by all the people around him. Be quiet. He's got more important things to do. But the man calls out even louder. Louder. He's blind, but he knows that Jesus is in the presence. He may not be able to see with his eyes, but he sees with his heart. And he knows that that person that he's heard is here is the one who can set him free. So he comes not because he has anything to offer, because he's worthy, or because he's somebody of great shakes. He comes because he has a need. Do you have a need? He wants you to come. You may be blinded by the fact that you're not worthy. You may be blinded by the fact that you think that you don't know right, the right words to say. You can't pray like so-and-so who stands up in the middle of the congregation. But he's saying to you, you can come. I will make it possible. My Holy Spirit will pray with you. I'll enable you to pray. Come to me. Bring your need. Chapter 19 begins with the one who combines all the previous stories together. This is Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. Remember the tax collector story? He's a tax collector. He's not just a tax collector. He's the chief. He's the worst of all of them. He is also very rich. Rich men can't come to God because they love their riches too much. So he's got a lot of things going against him here. He's rich, and he's a tax collector, and he's blind. Well, wait a minute. No, he can see. He could see that Jesus was coming. No, he couldn't see Jesus. That's why he climbed the tree. It was the people that made him blind. They were too big for him, and he couldn't see past them. So he was rich. He was a sinner. He was blind. But he had a determination. I want to see Jesus. Jesus comes under this tree. I don't know about you, but I love this story because... You can just feel his heart pounding. The one that he has come and uh, he's climbed this tree. You know, it wasn't easy for him to climb the tree. It's an embarrassing thing to have to do that. And he knows that everybody's looking at him. There's Zacchaeus. What is he doing up there? There's that tax collector. with. It. We all hate him. What is he doing in the tree? They're laughing, pointing at him. Look at that fat little guy up in the tree. But somehow he doesn't care because he wants to meet with Jesus. He wants to see him. He doesn't have hopes for meeting him. Just to see him would be enough. But knows he is, he is coming towards him. He is actually going to, he's going to pass under my tree. I'm going to see him really up close. 
And then total astonishment. Zacchaeus, oh my goodness, he sees me. Of course he sees you. You're in the middle of the tree. He says, Zacchaeus, come down. Come down because I need, I need to eat at your house today. I need to come to your house. Do you understand the, how he felt at that point? Talk about feeling important. Some, talk about feeling like this is the best thing that has ever happened to me. And Jesus is inviting me to let him come to my house? Well, I'm sure he's, he, he toppled down the tree. He probably didn't land very well. But he was so happy, and he grabbed on to Jesus and led him to his house. And then you see in the story as he's leaving, it is his own conscience that's being spoken by everybody else. There he goes. He's going to the house of a sinner. That's why, that's why Zacchaeus didn't go right up to Jesus and say, hey, could you come to my house today? He didn't think Jesus would ever do that. But here he is, and everybody's speaking what he used to think that Jesus would do. Only he finds that Jesus is totally different from what he had ever expected. He desired to meet with him. So Jesus overcomes his richness. He overcomes him being a chief of the, of the tax collectors. He overcomes his blindness. And then he opens his eyes to see that there is grace, that there is a way to connect with God. And so he gets it. He gets up and he says, today I'm going to give half of all that I own to the poor. That is so huge. And if I've cheated, that if is a huge if, because there's a long list of people that he has cheated. If I've cheated anyone, I'm going to give it back to them four times what I've taken. And there's this incredible evidence of sight. Because now he knows who Jesus really is. And he knows about grace. And Jesus said, unlike the others, this man is a true Israelite. This man recognized his unworthiness. He came and asked by sitting in the tree. And now his heart has been changed. If you've come to Jesus you came at great expense because it took a miracle for you to acknowledge your sin and it took a miracle for you to have faith that Jesus indeed would forgive and that your life would change as a result of that. Do you suppose that it's harder for him to take you in as his child than it is for him to take you in as one who comes in prayer as a child? You've already become one of his. And so I am calling upon our congregation. Do not let Satan tell you that you're not worthy to pray. Do not let yourself speak to yourself and say, I don't know the words. It doesn't matter if you don't know the words. Come to him and speak your need. Begin this conversation with God. Do so on a regular basis. It will change your life. It will change your life. I'm challenging those of you who are husband and wife. I'm challenging you today to begin to pray together. Husbands, lead in this. Tell your wife that you've been convicted about a desire to pray together as our Father. We need to be together in prayer. Don't say that I've never been able to do it. Don't say that I, I've had a bad experience in the past. I, we're too competitive or, or maybe, you know, she laughed at me or whatever the case may be. Do it. Pray together. Come to the, your Father 
together. Come together as families. Come together as friends. We do so much to support one another when we pray together. When you leave today, I hope that you don't need to ask, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to pray. He is waiting. He is knocking at the door. And he who opens the door, he will come in and sup with you. He will fellowship with you. He desires that more than anything. Let us determine in our hearts that we'll make him happy by doing it. One of the things that I would like us to do, we have five minutes left, and we're going we're to sing in a moment. We have been for the last couple of days really hearing a lot about what's going on in France. Remember about the, uh, the attack that happened on those poor people. We want to, I want us to experience, uh, to make a statement today of our sense of our oneness. Maybe they're not believers with us, but they are, they're part of our earthly family. And I'm going to ask us as a congregation to pray for those in France. We don't have much time, and so I'm going to ask all of us to pray at the same time. I'm going to ask our organist and our pianist to make their way towards the instruments and uh, play our closing hymn. And while they are pray playing that, I'm going to ask you to pray just where you are or maybe pray with your wife or pray in a group of two or three. Whatever it takes, let's all just lift up these dear people. If you don't know what to pray for, I've put an insert in your bulletin. Remember from, uh, from Nate and Erica Shorb. I put that in there so that you would have some ideas about what to pray for so that we would uh, lift these dear people up. There are parents who have lost children. There are children who have lost parents. There are brothers and sisters who have lost brothers and sisters, friends who have lost friends. We know what this is like. We went through this with the Twin Towers when they were attacked. And now it is our opportunity to support them at this time. And so I'm asking it, your, your grace, maybe actually for another two or three, four minutes. Let's just pray for them and lift them up before the Lord and pray that God will reveal himself to those who are in need today. So would you pray, play for us, Nancy. Um, play, yeah, you got it, right.